I'm Dr. Scott Lyons, and you're watching or listening to the Gently Used Human Podcast. Today, we are talking about red flag couture. You know, when you chase those red flags because it gets you all hot and bothered. When those trauma tingles get you all mixed up with the idea of love. And how to heal those deep relational patterns, how to set some boundaries, and we're going to laugh a lot. That's why I asked Inkem and Defo and Kai Cheng Tom to join me today, sharing their personal wisdom and their deep understanding of trauma, relationships, and healing. Inkem and Defo is a clinician, teacher, speaker, and strategist, and is the founder of Lumos Transforms and the creator of the Resilience Toolkit, also one of my besties. Kai Cheng Tom is a certified somatic sex educator, social worker, mediator, and certified personal coach. Her work focuses on the intersection of social justice, pleasure activism, and transformative approaches to human conflict. She is the author of five award-winning books. Oof, let's get this party started. Should we take some deep breaths together? <gasps> I hate deep breathing. It always makes me more. It makes you hard? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it makes me hard. Wow. Okay. <laughs> well, that begins our show. <laughs> In Kim, I'm going to kick it off with you. As a former model, I'm wondering if you can help us unpack what is <laughs> couture? Oh, you got me wrong, hun. <laughs> <laughs> I was a teen model. I was a teen model. Teens don't do couture. Oh. No, we don't. We don't do couture. I'm like a, I don't know, a former, um, like a child actor grown up, right? Like a child model grown up. I was briefly a model. <laughs> I just need you to know. She was on the cover of a couple magazines. <laughs> I was not I on the cover of a couple magazines. You were not. Oh, well. I was a sass, the sassy girl. Oh, my God. Will you email us? <laughs> I want to see you on the cover of Sassy. Are you too young to remember Sassy? Okay. How old do you think I am? <laughs> 45? Um, 30? No, you're in your 30s. <laughs> She's definitely in her early 30s. A lady never tells. A lady never tells. Okay, diving into our topic at hand. What is trauma tingles? And Kim, I, I feel like you are one of the originators of that term, but um, Kai, you are also one of the originators of getting into trauma tingles. So... <laughs> I, I think this might be the first time I've heard the term trauma tingles, but I'm really, it. but you've definitely heard of red flag couture. I have heard of red flag couture many times. <laughs> so let's start with just defining like what is trauma tingles and it's in relation to relationships. The term just came to me um, in my dating adventures. I think when I first said it is I am not doing trauma tingles anymore. Mm. That was it was the realization that, that excitement or what I would call like chemistry was actually my trauma tingles going because this felt familiar. It felt exciting. And that was my, um, I think, addiction to avoidance, <laughs> right? So when someone was avoidant, right, it was like a challenge and my trauma tingles of childhood started vibrating. And when I said, no more, I'm done. Yeah. Those are the trauma Those tingles. Those are the trauma tingles. And it's that like dating, mm -hmm. uh, you know, attracted to the things that keep hurting us. It's the, the, the magnetism, the sexual attraction where um, intensity is confused for intimacy, where red flags feel like home, where it's like we're more interested in the chase than the embrace. Okay. Now I'm, I just have to say, as you're talking, I'm feeling tingles. I'm like, oh my God. You're reading me. How dare you? <laughs> it's fine that I love men. They don't hurt me. It's great. I just want you to know. I don't believe in any of this. <laughs> <laughs> you have never been attracted to a red flag, Kai Ching Tom. Mm, you know, I just think that it is normal and healthy that I have dated maybe 30 or 40 men in a row, all of whom you know, maybe 
have already had like a t- turbulent dating history and say they only want to see me in secret and, um, you know, don't answer their text messages for four days to four months at a time. That's fine, right? I, I yeah, um, no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps we can each name, like, what are our red flags that we have or are currently attracted to? Mm. Because I think there's something about normalizing the fact that this is actually very much part of an adaptive survival response. This is reenactments of our childhood wounds in current relationships via red flags are actually more normal than we might think. So I'll go first. Um, I love a good avoidant. Oof, that gets me wet. You know, someone who, (laughs) someone who is like, I'm here for a red hot minute and then I'm going to slowly, slowly fade away and feel free to chase me just a little bit. So you self-abandon yourself and um, keep, keep attending to me. Um, That's one of my favorite red flags. Uh, I also love a good martyrdom situation, uh, you know, where I have dated quite a few um, folks who happen to have a propensity for addiction or absolute chaos or self-annihilation. And it too has been like intrinsically sexy is that is I don't I think that's the word I want to use where it's like it's that trauma tingle it's that buzz it's that excitement where I'm like I don't know why but that my my beacon keeps getting like ooh follow this direction towards them so dating has gone really well for me as well Kai <laughs> sure sounds that way <laughs> what about your red flags that both of you have uh, attended to that where the trauma tingles have led you. You or me first in Kim. I don't know. I think I'm kind of boring. It's like garden variety avoidance. The hearts of Azkaban. (laughs) Can you make a movie called the hearts of Azkaban? (laughs) That's just you dating. (laughs) You say boring, but (laughs) But it's, it's the intermittent. I'm not going to say garden variety avoidance. It's the fearful avoidant, right? It's so I am intense. I am present. I am here. We're sharing our deepest, darkest trauma secrets. I'm gone. Right? And so I think those are the folks that I'm like, I get that intensity and that hook, that excitement. Oh, this is so deep. This is so, and then the disappearing, the slow fade, less slow fade. They tend to do a little, it's like a slow fade and then they'll come back. So it's that, you know, that intermittent reinforcement. Mm. I think the the classic is the you're so amazing, but, and I'm like left in that lurch. You're so amazing, but. Yeah. That one. Yeah. That is, one. is that the same as like, I'm going to pedestal you, I'm going to love bomb you and kind of fade away or, or dismiss you simultaneously or intermittently? Are you a therapist? Um. <laughs> I happen to dabble in the therapies. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, yes. Did I just read you in Kem and Defo? Yes, you did. Oh, shit. Yes, you did. It's so interesting, though, is like as we talk about this, yeah. it's like really a marker of how much healing I've done because I actually feel a little nauseous. Mm. Mm. Like the trauma tingles from that sense of excitement and that like, ooh, it's like, ooh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, are you my therapist? <laughs> Did you just do that right now? Like in one sentence? <laughs> I mean, it's interesting that that's a sign of healing when like your old red flag trauma tingle attractions start to make you feel a little nauseous and it becomes unattractive. I mean, like I remember I used to, like read that and we'd say like, you know, like on, you know, Instagram pop psychology, make that whatever, become a turnoff. And I'm like, how Mm. is this even possible? Like, I couldn't Mm. even imagine it. And so I don't know what the the flip was, but it is, it's wild. I'm sure I'm probably developing or uncovered another layer of trauma tingles. (laughs) I probably need a little more therapy, Dr. Lyons. Well, here Um, we are. (laughs) To uncover it. Maybe I'll discover (laughs) more trauma tingles now. I don't know. 
I can imagine there's a lot of layers of un- unraveling trauma tingles, like where it's like, oh, I'm attracted to this unbelievable amount of chaos. And then I'm attracted to more like incognito chaos and then more subtle chaos. Um, things that essentially keep me from feeling too intimate, too, you know, in the in the danger of intimacy. Right. Like the danger of of ordinariness, mm-hmm. right? Like there's so many kinds of danger. And I think there's like the delicious danger of like that like really intense love bomb then breadcrumb kind of cycle that we're just that we've just been talking about. The like, oh my God, you're my soulmate. I have to <laughs> and then they're like, they go to the bathroom and never come back, right? Something <laughs> like that. And you're like, oh well, they're just went to the bathroom. They're gonna come back and tell me more about their soul any second now. And then maybe they do six months later, right? There's like, you know, the love bomb breadcrumb thing. So there, that's a danger. And then, you know, there's the danger of like the intense obsessive, you know, which I'll just go ahead and say, you know, everything y'all are saying about avoidance, like fearful avoidance is a tingle for me. I also have a trauma tingle around like a bad boy who is obsessed with me. Like the person who's like, oh, hey, babe, I just showed uh, up to the yoga studio to pick you up after your class. And, you know, you didn't ask him to pick you up. And you're not sure how he knows that you're, you're, you had a yoga class. That was really exciting for me once upon a time. It still is a little bit exciting for me. But I knew even at the time, like, that's, that's dangerous, right? But the danger you're talking about, Scott, like the danger of intimacy that we are often running away from is the danger of ordinariness. Like, it's like, oh, that someone might see me when I'm not like their amazing soulmate, when they're not like obsessed with like a pedestalized figure of me, but me like, you know, getting out of the shower in not a sexy way, like me having just used the bathroom, me having just like, you know, woken up, like really bloated. Like, I think that is often the danger we are running from. Mm. 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 It's interesting though, like the, the pedestalizing I remember telling a guy, I said, looked at him and I said, get me off this pedestal because I'm going to fall and break my neck. Mm. I'm going to fall and break my neck. Like I felt imprisoned by it and that there was no, like I could only disappoint from where, and I'm like, please remove me. Just like get me off. But not knowing how to do that. Like not knowing like, like how did I get here? And and like, please get me off this ride. Um, so it's very interesting, like wanting to be known as ordinary, but maybe that was my own, like wanting to be um, allowed to be human, but at the same time, the fear of being seen and connected to as human. So both and. Kind of amazing that these are our primal needs as infants, to be witnessed, to be seen, to be heard. This essentially is part of co-regulation, part of safety construction, part of our own sense of preservation. And yet it still is amazing to me that as adults, this is also our biggest fear for so many folks. And and the interrupter from the very thing we might desire and the very thing we seek as a primal need. Totally. Yeah. Well, I mean, what's coming for me now is like that Winnicott quote that people love, right? Like, it's it is joy to be hidden, but a disaster not to be found. Like, (sighs) totally longing to be seen in our ordinary everydayness to the depth of like who we are. Like, and then also just like that's awful, (laughs) and um, like running away from it, and then feeling lonely. You know, like, and I think so much of these like weird dating patterns, the trauma tingles make sense when we think about. It's like most people. Um, are trying to meet a set of contradictory needs at the same time. Mm. So like, you know, I, it sounds like we, we might be a bit of an anxious crowd, <laughs> the three of us, you know. <laughs> just gonna did go you, ahead did and you say just read us? Rude. <laughs> <laughs> I'm recovering from like hyper avoidance. I'm recovering. Ah, I'm got it, got it, got I'm it. I'm versatile. I can also be avoidant. Thank you very much. Mm, okay, well, yes. <laughs> Um, I'll just come out as like a hyper anxious with like some avoidant features or like maybe there's like a disorganized feature Mm. in there sometimes, but we're trying to meet contradictory needs, right? Like an an avoidant is usually trying to get that like deep intimacy without the risk of being seen. And the anxious is usually trying to like get consistency um, without the, the risk of being left behind. 
And we're all just trying to do that. And I think, you know, the like mind boggling behavior of the people we're dating just, I don't, I don't know, falls much more into place for me when I, when I, when I'm like, right, they, they don't understand this probably. Um, but they've got at least two competing needs inside them at any given time. And I think this starts to explain why, you know, on one hand we might say, oh, why is the dating scene so awful? Why is dating so awful? And not even recognize our own contribution to the suffering that we might experience as part of dating, as like uh, to even recognize our own addiction to the losing game of it. And it's like how we're setting ourselves up because it's easy to project and be like, oof, I keep dating toxic humans, you know, or, or really like throwing it out on that it's about them or it's about the timing. It's about all these external conditions. And it's so hard to see our own contribution, our own process of, Oh no. Oh, you can see it. Oh no, Scott. I can see. I can see. I was just like, uh, you know, Maybe you're an alien. You know, what, what I would settle for and what yeah. was like, but you know, you know, having such neglect as a little person, yeah. like I, you know, just what is my barometer? My barometer is fucking broken yeah. mm-hmm. about, you know, you know, the realization that, oh, I, I'm allowed to have a need. Mm. Like, are you kidding mm-hmm. me? And so then having to check is this a normal need or am I asking too much? Like literally not knowing how to judge what, what's coming in. Oh, but of course, like, because I can take care of myself, I don't need that. So I can understand absolutely my contribution, absolutely my contribution. And it is a hellscape out there. Mm. It is a hellscape on those apps. (laughs) It is both. And (laughs) I'm just going to be very clear. It is both. both And it is both. And well, yeah, I agree. It's about that. Like, I, you know, so I, I do want to say for for the purpose of insight and also for the, like my own ego, I'm in a happy marriage, right? Like, um, I've been in a relationship for eight years, and more or less, I find it miraculous. I'm not sure how this happened. Like, it total by accident, you know. Like, um, my amazing spouse is just so incredible, and I'm also polyamorous. I don't need to date other people to find great love because I have this person. Um, that I have amazing, ordinary, everyday love with, um, and we've had it for eight years. But I still go to the apps, <laughs> even though there's this amazing other person, um, because something is addicted in me, right? Like there is like this thing where I'm like, I'm still looking for um, something, and maybe sometimes I'm looking for you know more great, amazing love. That's also a possibility in polyamory. <laughs> you know, that I think that's the healthy polyamory. But, you know, I also know myself and like there, there is something I think about the drama of the chase or being chased, obsessing and being obsessed over that I can't live without. And like, I think that's just fascinating because it's totally a hellscape, right? And like, I, I ask myself all the time, like, if my needs are already being met, like in this uh, like wonderful marriage with this wonderful person, Why do I subject myself to this? (laughs) You know, when a more logical person might just be like, I'll get in and like get out, you know? Is it ever logical? Is it logic have anything to do here? (laughs) Like, not at all. Not at all. I'm also like, I practice relationship anarchy, which is not necessarily polyamorous or monogamous. It's like whatever the agreements are totally between the folks involved. So I've been both polyamorous and monogamous. I can only tolerate so much on those apps. It really is a hellscape. And I think, um, like I have carpal tunnel from all the left swiping. Like it's (laughs) significant. It's really significant. This is how much better I'm coming out of trauma tingles. Mm. Sunglasses in the first picture, swipe. Mm, Nice. Back turned away in the pictures, swipe. Can't bother to write anything, swipe. Left, left, left. Like, so just even the things that would be, oh, look, there's a mystery, there's an intrigue, not mm. even. I realize like a big part, because I'm actively dating right now, is looking at people who are already nesting or who are already living together, who are already partnered. As a polyamorous person, that's not a problem for me. But I realized what a setup for me, because I really do want a entangled life partner. 
Mm -hmm. And so by looking for some, no one really has two life partners. I mean, maybe someone has amazing capacity, but let's be honest. And so I was looking for basically being somebody's secondary, knowing that they had an upward limit about how much they had to give. And I'm like, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. Hmm. And so even though there were some amazing matches and the, it's like, Ooh, this is like, feels really great. I realized I was literally setting myself up for repetition. And I was super proud when I just bowed out, I just said, you're great. I really love this connection. And I realized that there's an upper limit of what's available. Trauma tingles deactivated. <laughs> yeah. <Woo! laughs> oh my God. This celebration. I want to take a moment to give a loud shout out to The Embody Lab, which is ugh, one of the most incredible resources for body-based and somatic therapies. This show is all about healing, and The Embody Lab does exactly that. Whether you're on your own journey of transformation and discovery, or enhancing your skill sets in your career as like a coach or a therapist, a body worker, or really any career where you are supporting other gently used humans, the Embody Lab is your place for deep, inspiring, and impactful workshops, certificates, master classes, and an incredible community of like minded folks. I love the Embody Lab, and so do so many other people that call it a platform to come home to over and over again. The Embody Lab is giving my listeners an exclusive offer, a one-time 10% off code to enhance your embodied well-being. All you have to do is go to theembodylab.com and use the code GENTLYUSE10 at checkout. And the healing begins. You're really getting to like rewiring the reenactment pattern. And I, I, I would love to like deconstruct for everyone, like, you know, because the trauma tingles is this, you know, we talked about like this invisible beacon. It's drawing me towards either the familiar or the place where I will continue to be in the cycle of typically unhappiness or suffering or frustration. And, you know, reenactments are, are these patterns of essentially saying, how is the currency of love established as a child? That's one way we can look at it is like, oh, love was given when I would take care of my mom. Like when she was sick or when she was depressed, um, then I would attend to her and suddenly I would feel a witnessed or seen or held or important. Going back to Kai's word, like important. And then that becomes the currency for love that I repeat, I reenact it, looking for all the places where I can be that martyr so that I can feel the currency of love that I know. And this is why, like, going back for a moment to saying, like, how am I setting myself up to still be in the same situations? Like, and it's disappointing. Like, uh, here I am as the martyr taking care of this person. And then I have this need because I'm human and they can't meet it. And I, and it feels devastating. Mm -hmm. And it's like, uh, you know, I was, I was talking to this uh, friend yesterday and he gave this great quote. Like, if I walk through the day and I see an asshole, they're probably an asshole. If I walk through the day and I think everyone's an asshole, it's likely I'm the asshole. The way that I am continuously finding myself in the consistency of like frustrations or the hellscape or the disappointments of, of relationship that reaffirms even a limited belief I have about myself, like I'm not worthy of love or I'm not good enough for anyone else or I wasn't meant to be in love in this lifetime. You know, it's that confirmation bias that solidifies that reenactment pattern too. You know, being a trans woman dating is like running into the same pattern over and over and over again as well. And mm -hmm. there's like an undeniable part of that that is like an external reality, right? So mm -hmm. I've dated probably like 900 men um, <laughs> and all of the, well. I can't even get a second <laughs> you know. date. 
<laughs> you Kai. <laughs> Let's just say, you know, I'm I'm amazing. <laughs> I'm like, you know. Um like, you know, but by dated, I mean like maybe, you know, over the course of a lifetime, you know, maybe one date to between one date and, you know, years of dating, right? But when one is a trans woman dating cisgender, mostly straight identified men, what you're going to get is a pattern of like intense connection um, for like maybe one, you know, one date to one week and then like extreme avoidance and like this kind of like pattern of like stigma, right? Like most straight men who are dating trans women, I think this is changing today, but for, for a long time it was like, um, like only wanting to do it in secret. In fact, it wasn't really even dating, right? Like it was like, uh, I want to like hook up with you in secret. And then like, maybe there's some like romantic gestures that only happen, you know, in the apartment or in the home and never in the outside world. Like we're never to be seen together in public. Right. And this pattern is um, driven by, you know, systemic transphobia. So, you know, for a long time, you know, I was like, oh, men are just awful because they uh, have so much internalized homophobia and transphobia and, the reason I'm being treated so awfully is because of this oppression. And if only I, you know, lived in a more just world, then everything would be amazing and perfect. <laughs> um, you know, I'd be living my Disney princess romance life. And as it turns out, that's not true. But it's easy for me to, like, avoid looking at, like, my internal pattern and my confirmation bias because it's, like, it's just a truth that the system out there is so bad. And, like, and what I described is, like, even, like, the better part of like the like societal transphobia around dating, right? Like there's also just like a ton of cis men on trans women, intimate partner violence, uh, like that's driven by, um, by this reality. But then, you know, what happens now is like, I'm like, okay, so I'm in my thirties. I'm, you know, in a marriage. I have like a lot of life stability now. Why am I still saying yes to like men who only want to date in secret, right? Or like, why am I still saying yes to, to guys who are like, oh, we're seeing each other, but I would never tell my kids <laughs> like about you, something like that. For me, like my pattern of saying yes, I think is about like wanting to, like wanting to achieve the unattainable, right? Like my parents were always like, you have to win to be lovable. You have to get perfect grades and be a perfect af- athlete, you know, things I could never be. And I'm like, right, like there is an unattainable prize out there and I will attain it, you know? Mm-hmm. I'm going to win those men, except of course I won't. And like, that's not like even, and even if I did, that wouldn't be a healthy relationship because relationships are not an achievement. Um, but, you know, that's what's driving me. And I am happy to say like that, that tingle, like the tingle of like, I'm going to win. I'm going to like make them love me. Like I'm going to be so amazing that like some terrified straight guy, you know, with a wife <laughs> and children is going to like have a divorce, come out <laughs> and like date me in public. Like that's not going to happen. And even just last month, I think um, I was like with this guy who was like, I think he already had been divorced and he was like, yeah, you know, someday soon we're going to, we're going to go <laughs> in public. And I was like, great. Um, and we had set this date we were just going to like hang out at and um, like go to see a play or something. And the morning of, I got all these text messages that were like, Oh, you know, I'm not feeling so good. Maybe you could just uh, like come over for a couple hours, but then I, I would really need you to leave. And I was like, baby, you are not treating me good. Hmm. Please never text me again. Hmm. Um, yes. yes! <laughs> the cheerleading yes! squad is here. Yes. <laughs> And like the, the, that never text me again thing is so is like such a win for me because like there's the actual achievement, right? Because like in the past I would have been like, no, I can turn this around. Like I will go over for a couple hours and I'm he's gonna fall in love with me and he'll see like how incredible I am. No, like baby just never text me again. <laughs> I love it. Can we have a t-shirt? Baby never text me again. <laughs> yes, we'll make merch. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make merch. <laughs> Baby, never text me again. Ugh. You know, I, I think it's like the realization. I mean, I'm a daughter of a Nigerian immigrant with that same pattern. Like, you know, you've got to achieve. And being the girl, like where we, you know, just don't matter. Like, doesn't matter how. And so there is a sense of um, like a futility. Like, it doesn't matter I could have all the perfect grades. I could have all the things. And it still doesn't matter. 
And so that is also there. And I, it's helped that, that little piece as difficult as it was as a child actually helps me in, I think around the dating, because there's a realization that it's just not me. Like no matter what I do, it's never going to cross that threshold with that person. And it allows me to, I guess, go into the disengagement, like whatever, and the hyper, hyper independence and avoidance. So it, it turned a different way. I think as the healing, the, the anxious that you're seeing, the sort of the fear, the fearful avoidant, the anxious piece that you're seeing, and I'm able to talk about now came after I was able, even able to engage mm-hmm. where I, it did matter. It did matter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's wild out there. It is wild. I mean, if we're just even like, um, I saw a profile recently for a couple looking for a third and they literally said, we want to use it. It? As a it. The word was it. Oh my God. How dehumanizing. It is a hellscape out there. We want yeah, to use it. Is. I mean, it was a, yeah, we want to use it as a, like in our sex lives. And I was just like, so we can say that we are doing some reenactment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. It, when I say hellscape, I'm not saying that light. I mean, to really see that and the, the amount of, of dehumanization. And I will say as an over 50 year old femme, it's wild how shallow the dating pool is other than 20 year olds who are looking for a cougar experience. <gasps> Tell us about that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Left swipe. Left, left, left swipe. You're healing. Because you know yeah, what? No, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not doing casual sex at this point in my life. That was also a big thing. It's like junk food for me. I can't, it does not nurture me. Mm. Tastes good, feels spicy, and I don't feel, I feel empty. And, you know, it's like if it works for folks, great. But for me, just right now, again, the trauma tingles one by one have been deactivated. It's a little boring. Mm-hmm. I have to say, but boring in a good way, like in a peaceful way. And so when something comes and it has that same level of spice, it's like, Ooh, it's actually jarring for my nervous system. My nervous system is in a different place where I'm like, I just want peace. Like I just know, yeah. just know. Yeah. So those red flags would, you know, that used to be like, Ooh, you could make a beautiful dress, mm. a couture, a couture. dress. Ooh, I'm just like, we circle back. Yeah. Circles that. <laughs> yeah. You know, I have a question for both of you. As you both know, I love you both very, very much. How do I know that's not trauma tingles? Wow, confrontation. Confrontation. Ooh. This is like an encounter group from the 70s, man. <laughs> <laughs> this is like um, how do I know? How like how how, do I, how might I it's not, register how might like i register do you imagine like the discernment here between like love and trauma tingles intensity and intimacy i think like i've got two ideas one is like it's that idealization pedestalization thing right like so if you love me very much first of all that's great thank you i'm not surprised um and (laughs) Second, but it's like, you know, are you, are you thinking about me in like an obsessive way where like I can do no wrong, right? Like, is there this, and like, you know, like obsession, like a little, a little like crush of any kind, you know, platonic, romantic, sexual, whatever is fine and normal. But if there's this kind of intense, like this person is perfect and better than me and I need them and without them I'll die, mm. like that, that might be a sign of a trauma tingle, right? Like mm-hmm. the without them I'll die, they're everything to me. Especially if that really, if the relationship doesn't have a depth or length that is like appropriate, like for that level of attachment, right? Like, which brings me to my second idea, like, is that, which is that we can't really know fully, I think without the intervention of time. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I'm married to someone, they are my world, and it would be awful without them, at least at first, you know. <laughs> but we've been together for years and made vows to one another. It's like, it's appropriate for us to have like that level of intensity with one another, and our lives are intertwined um, intentionally. But for someone I've been dating for six months, like, I don't know really, like, how much is trauma tingles and how much is... Um, like real or how much is like generative because 
I kind of just need to wait and see, like, what are the patterns that are unfolding? Like, is it the same old push-pull? Is it the same, like, delicious junk food and then I feel sick feeling? Or is it different, right? We need to remember that, like, slow and steady Mm. is, like, is the way that we heal. Like, through relationship, we're wounded. Through relationship, we're healed. And that takes time. Yes. To me, the word that came was grasping. Mm. So one of the the ways that I can tell for myself is that I feel like I'm sitting in my seat. I'm sitting in my seat. I am neither leaning in like this, grasping, or pulling away. It's the always, the ever, the, the dial is turned up because there is a natural, like we move, we're always in movement. That is not the issue. It's that it has a certain charge to it Mm. and an extra little spice. And it would be different because the thing is I won't die, right? Like when you said, like, if they're gone, I won't die is probably is a healthy statement, but for an avoidant, let them go. I'm fine. Right. Like I'm not going to die. Like that could be the trauma tingle. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's actually the reverse. It's like, I'm fine. I, I, I can take care of myself. So it's knowing what your own patterns are. Yeah. Does this feel, is it like are the saying, oh, I'm here again. Mm-hmm. The sense of I'm here again can be like ding, 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 mm-hmm. ding, ding, ding. Many, many years ago, a friend had me, you know, just do that little trick where you write each relationship on a piece of paper and what went wrong. Oh. <laughs> And by the fourth paper, you're like, same thing. It's the same thing. You're writing the same thing. And who's the common denominator? Me. So I can see it. Like if I'm in that, oh, oh, here we go again. This is like, there's a familiar sense. It's often trauma tingles. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it, it is, you know, having to ask. The rush of a crush, right? It feels great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I don't want to diminish that. It's... I've been just being discerning and pausing and slowing down and seeing like, does this grow legs? Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does this deepen? What happens when I do something different than I've done before? Yeah. Do I feel it rubber band back? I love that, that sort of pause in the, I don't know, the thrill, the exhilaration, the intensity. It's important to recognize it's not going to stop the relationship to pause and reflect. And I, I'm hearing like if there's an, there's such an urgency that pausing feels like destructive, that's probably a good indicator that it's trauma tingles. Like if I pause, if I, they won't still be there or we won't be able to keep going together or whatever it is if I don't pause. I think that's a really, that's a good indicator. I really appreciated what you said in Kim about like being able to sit in your seat. Mm -hmm. I think it it took me a long time to realize my own pattern. I used to think that I was so generous that people would take advantage and and, and burst my boundary. And I I realized uh, most recently when I was seeing someone that I, I was annihilating my own boundary. My, my own grasping, my own reaching out, my own chasing of them, which was my own self-abandonment, was essentially annihilating my own boundary. And then I was left feeling obliterated and needing them to sort of clean me up or to clarify where I was. And it, you know, to me, it was like such a big, oh, this, this is the action of my trauma tingles. The trauma tingles are that invisible sensation that kind of led me to that same person where I could reenact my same pattern. But I have amazing friends who were able to help me clarify, oh, it it sounds like you've fallen out of yourself again. Oh, you know, can you check in and feel your own sense of boundary right now? Because even in your voice, it feels like it's all about them. And where the hell are you? And that sort of reflection process really led me to identify a pattern that manifested by following and and trying to trauma bond and follow those tingles. I think about the self-abandonment, right? When I'm self-abandoned for connection, 
and then the person leaves, I am truly alone because they are gone and I am not with myself. Mm -hmm. Both, right? And that the realization is if I do not self-abandon, if they leave, I am still with myself was such a turning point. It was such a turning point. It's like, oh, I didn't die. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't die, right? I didn't die. And then that experience is um, imprinted and I can come back to it. And it becomes easier to, and has become easier to say, yeah, this is a need for me. Mm. Not, this isn't a want, this is a need. Does that work? Yeah. Is that is this available with you? And it doesn't mean that that person is disposable. It just means that the way this relationship is configured isn't working for me. And maybe we need to reconfigure it. Like in a good relationship anarchy style, we'll reconfigure the relationship hmm. in a way that's mutually satisfying. But I'm not erasing my needs. Yeah. Yeah. I love that in Kim. And I love that idea of like reconfiguring without erasing. Like, I think sometimes in, like, the self-help world where, like, dating is really still conceptualized within, like, a specific kind of, like, compulsory monogamy, compulsory heterosexuality, like, kind of thing, there's sometimes this, like, idea that's, like, oh, well, stop dating toxic people, Mm -hmm. stop being toxic, and then there's, like, this class of, like, good healed people uh, with reasonable needs and reasonable boundaries. And then those good healed people find each other and like date in their lovely, reasonable world. And I'm like, no, 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 no. The the apps are a hellscape because our inner worlds, you know, as human beings, sometimes they're a hellscape and sometimes they're just chaotic. Right. And like, I don't really believe that um, the majority of us can actually transform ourselves into like that, like, totally reasonable all the time, always super balanced, like perfect balance of like needing others and being with ourselves. Some of us are going to be more avoidant. Some of us are going to be more anxious. And some of us are going to have like a, like a flow of that in and out of our lives. Right. It was huge for me when I realized first that I could say to the avoidant people in my life, you know, I have some needs around consistency, like showing up when you say you're going to show up that will help me to feel not like I'm completely losing control of myself, right? Like it will help me to feel grounded and sane, not to be sanest, but it will help me to feel, you know, like that way if you show up, uh, when you say you're going to show up, and if you can't do that, then we can't be together, you know, Mm. in in any way. That was huge. Um, Without shame, right? Like I was like, no, actually, it just makes me feel crazy when you say we're going to do something and then... The day of, I have to ask you, are you going to, you know, are you still coming over? Are we still going out? And you say, oh no, sorry, I had to take my mom shopping or like whatever, right? Like, and then it was also huge for me to realize that I, it would be helpful or it's often helpful for me to say to my avoidant partners, like, and you know what? Even though I need consistency, it is okay for you to need space. It is Mm -hmm. okay for you to not have the frequency that like that I'm asking for. Like what I need is for you to show up when you say you're going to show up, you know, with some margin for error. And it's like, I think what you're saying is what you need from me is like to not always be asking for contact. And there's not shame in that either. Like I think it's easy to shame like an anxious tendency as like clingy and crazy and obsessive. And it's easy to shame an avoidant tendency as like toxic and shut off and like, you know, um, frigid or whatever but like really like it's about the agreement right Mm -hmm. like it's Mm -hmm. about like what what allows us to be together in a way where we are still getting pleasure from one another and and maybe there's no set of agreements like that um you know in this lifetime for a certain set of people or at least not in this month um but that doesn't mean that our tendencies are bad right like it, it it just means that we're not a fit And is there a way to make this fit so it's mutually satisfying? Because sometimes it just isn't. And it's, again, not, you know, that someone's bad or good. It's just, can we make this mutually satisfying? For me, a biggest part is self-awareness. That's a deal breaker for me when some, I can't say, (laughs) men that I've dated, oh, I'm securely attached. (laughs) I've read the attached book and I'm like... Mm -hmm. spicy Um, so the self-awareness to say like instead of enacting it 
is to say, I need space yeah. instead of enacting it through behavior and then say, no, no, everything's fine. What are you talking about? That kind of crazy making? No, thank you. I think for me, like my tolerance is people who have a ton, not just a very polarized conflict within themselves. We all are ambivalent, but very polarized conflict. I'm not going on that ride. And like, I don't know what that would, I don't like the word toxicity that much because it's so, so mm, stigmatizing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just really polarized and like, that's a limit for me. Mm. I prefer the term, the gently used human. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. I like that. That's yeah. nice. Do we get merch? You Do we get merch? merch? And on the back it says, baby never text baby me. Baby never text me back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Shame around like, here are 20 red flags to avoid. And, and these people are toxic. And it totally dismisses that this is a human being on the other end. And the quote unquote toxicity or the quote unquote red flags are adaptive survival strategies. Yes. Yeah. And so what I'm really attracted to in my trauma tingles is someone else's ad adaptive survival strategies and mine in a way that continues to reenact and replay what is familiar. Because familiar feels safe, regardless of safety. Familiar feels familiar. It's familiar unsafety feels familiar. that we're, right? Lack of safety is that, um, the thing is, is I don't think people are disposable. It doesn't necessarily mean I want them close to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I don't difference. need to call you toxic. I can see that you're having a trauma response in all the kind of way. I can see your heart, you know, the Azkaban, like, you know, the closing of it. Mm -hmm. I can see it. I know where it comes from. I, it makes sense. It doesn't mean I want to be in connection with it and that yeah. without judgment, right? Because I, again, it's like the puzzle piece of my particular trauma and your particular trauma, it's not fitting for me yeah. anymore. Right? right. Well, and you know what comes for me as I listen to you say that and Kim is like, right, yeah. And like, I don't have to label myself toxic also to know that some of my strategies to make myself you know, feel okay, or like, you know, some of my survival strategies are not pleasant for other people to experience, you know, and are counter to bringing them closer to me. Like, you know, I'm a classic crazy ex-girlfriend, <laughs> you know, like my actual tendency when someone is avoidant and kind of like drifts away from me is like to want to send them like 10,000 text messages, you know, like I'm like, I'm the person who writes so many emails, many, many long paragraphs about like, what did, what are you doing to me? How could this be? Remember all the times that were great together? And also, you know, like that is actually the impulse inside of me. I don't do it anymore. Thank God. <laughs> um, but uh, like, and you know, it, I, it's funny to be um, like kind of a, someone on the other side of that now. Cause I'm like, right. Yeah. What did I think was going to happen? Like, um, you know, someone is saying I need space through their behavior and then, you know, send them, uh, you know, 15,000 word email probably doesn't feel like space to them, actually. Um, and it's probably not going to make them feel better about me. No, no. That's prolific, 15,000 words. I'm a good writer. <laughs> uh, you <laughs> have written this, several you know, books, including children's perfect. books. <laughs> yeah. like, you know, like designed to make someone feel guilty about not spending time with me. And for, you know, that's like... Oh, um, I love weaponized empathy. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Antisocial empathy. <laughs> oh God. Uh -huh. <laughs> so we could call that toxic, and you know, I'm, I'm okay to hear that. But also, like, it's a strategy. It's right? a strategy, and I think there's a phasic response of healing wounds and relationships. Relationships bring wounds, as you said. Relationships bring healing, and there is a stage to which it might be really helpful to be like, "Oh, they're toxic. They're this label. They're narcissistic. They're da 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 da. They're you know all these things." that maybe create a little buffer so I can attend to myself. But if I don't, if I keep using that to push and, and project, then I never really attend to myself. I've gotten backlash on social media for offering a rehumanization framework for narcissism. Oh, people and hate that. People, people hate, hate, hate people, that. And, and it, it shocked me because they're like, they're toxic. They're narcissists. If I even give them the, the littlest amount of humanization, I will be hurt again. 
I will lose myself. I will lose myself. And it's an interesting thing of like, well, if the projection and the the labeling continues to give all the energy and focus to them and not to you, that is true. You will continue to lose yourself if you let go. Because perhaps like in that same way of self-abandonment, the hurt and the rebuilding never got to be attended to as a possibility. I you know I go the other way yeah. where I give so many chances. I give so many chances yeah. and so much understanding that that's actually my way of self-abandonment. Mm-hmm. Whether they have a label or not, it's just mm-hmm. like, oh, but there's trauma. Oh, but they don't mean to. This is not intentional. This is a survival strategy. And I use that understanding as an erasure of my needs. Are we twins? Are we? We're totally twins in that way. <laughs> <laughs> and so the labeling, sometimes I understand it not even just as a way to push away, but a way to understand. Yeah. Because being with a narcissist is highly confusing. Yeah, and so absolutely. the like desire for that clarity, how yeah. do we hold on to humanity? And just, you know, as Kai Cheng said, that perfectly balanced my needs, your needs, <laughs> my needs, your needs. And all of us have the need for humanity. So if my only safety rests on the dehumanization of, of the other, yeah, that's a whole nother trauma tangle going on. Yeah, totally. Well, you know what I'm taking away from that exchange between the two of you, which was lovely. <laughs> it's like, actually, like, I, I would be way more okay with like labeling even clinical like pathologization terminology, if that didn't seem to automatically come with dehumanization, yeah. right? Like if we yeah. could say, yeah. oh, yeah. these are some signs of narcissistic behavior or like a narcissistic complex, even a narcissistic person. And what that means is that that person is A, probably having a hard time, and B, has probably lived through something where they needed to be a narcissist to survive, yeah. Then, yeah, that would be very helpful. <laughs> you know, like the label then becomes a doorway into empathy, the pro-social empathy kind. Yeah. If someone could look at uh, at Kai Cheng Tom and be like, "Oh, you know, that woman has like inside of her a classic crazy ex girlfriend because she has been driven crazy by men in her life," <laughs> you know, that is really different from someone saying, "Oh, she's crazy. Stay away from her forever." Yeah. Right? It makes me think about there's someone I'm I'm quite upset with in my life, and is it me? I didn't want to say it on air, but yeah, it's you. Me onto the podcast. The, Kai, this is an intervention. Inchem is here to mediate my absolute <laughs> frustration and disappointment uh, with how you've treated me as a friend. I can hear it. I can hold it. I seek repair. I, I can hold it. <laughs> no, not you, love. It's this interesting thing, and it's like I could label that person for what they've done. Uh, continuously. And I said to uh, my therapist the other day, I'm realizing I have to stir stories up to generate the anger it's taking to maintain the boundary of not talking to them. Oh. And that's something I don't want to do long term. Mm-hmm. And it, because I was like, it doesn't feel healthy to have to keep mm-hmm. doing that to generate the story of what they did to me when I was nine and the story they of what what happened last year that that made me need to take space it's that same thing for me of like if the label is like oh they have narcissistic traits fine but if i have to keep restoring and replaying the events and the story to maintain the boundary what is that price to me and my nervous system my question is is there an alternate way to maintain the boundary because if the this person's behavior is you know, so toxic, yeah. toxic, toxic <laughs> to you. Mm-hmm. She's talking about you, Kai. <laughs> oh, right. Sorry. Yeah. React. <laughs> Come on. React. In some way. In some way Never I'm text me again. Never, Never text me again. Never dude. text me again. It's actually, I'm sorry, it's going to be one of those tattoos where we can have it on our hands and we can just hold yeah. it up and go, Never text me Never. again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, this is a good idea. <laughs> No, you're right. And and that's my curiosity too, in Kim. That's what I'm interested in is what is the way, the sustainable way to maintain the boundary that doesn't come at a cost to me. Right now I don't know what that is, but that's it's certainly an inquiry, a curiosity I'm holding. 
Mm, like the question, you know, for you, Scott, it's like, how do I hold the boundary of this person without stirring up anger, like, without using that kind of like going back into this history and like kind of dredging up grievances, which sound quite legitimate, <laughs> very legitimate very grievances, legitimate. right? Yeah. And then the systemic question we're kind of asking is like, how can we hold on to people's humanity while also knowing that like we have been so burned by people in our past? And probably those people were even some way saying to us, like, you know, I'm a human. Let me get away with these horrible behaviors, right? Like, there's something in that that's so destabilizing, like, to to know that that was the pattern and then to be asked again to humanize someone who was treating you in a dehumanizing way. Mm-hmm. I think it really comes back to this, like, what feels good in the long term, right? Like, you know, the the labeling of someone as, like, ugh, like, pathological narcissist or like, you know, disgusting, toxic person, you know, may even be necessary in the early stages, right? Of separation and individuation. I I, kind of think it is. (laughs) Um, And then after that, it might become like, you know, like eating the fast food, right? Like it, it's like this rush of like, oh, I can hold the boundary because I'm powerful and that person is toxic. Mm. But like, um, it doesn't actually feel good in the body long term. Um, and if that is the tool we we use habitually, it becomes the tool we apply to most things, right? right? Like, it actually, it, that tool of, like, those people are toxic, here's 20 red flags, becomes a thing where we start to see 20 red flags in every person around us. I think, like, healing from, like, a harmful relationship is also opening ourselves up to risk. Like, everyone's going to come with at least some orange flags. You know, like every single person, (laughs) except for in chem. (laughs) (laughs) And um, romance does involve risk. All relationship involves risk. Yeah, friendships as well. And I'm still mad at you. (laughs) I can hold that. Never text me again. I can hold that. You can hold that. How about that? (laughs) I have an idea for you, Scott. Yeah. When I was thinking about a boundary rooted in love. Mm. Cause I was thinking like, how have I been able to hold boundaries? And it was from a sense of care for myself. Mm-hmm. And it's like in loving myself, I can't allow myself to be subjected to this volatility or this chaos or this, whatever uh, this self-involvedness that this other person has, because whatever the reason is, whatever they sure they have legitimate reasons for their self-involvedness and lack of consideration for me, but it's through a sense of, it's like with little kids, like I love you, I'm not going to let you put your finger in that socket. Yeah, I love you, I'm not going to let you run out in the street. It's not from a sense of anger; it's from a sense of care. Mm-hmm. And th- that's how I've been able to hold the boundaries. It's like, in fact, I I appreciate, like, this is just coming to clarity me, for me now. That when I've made different choices and I've been able to deactivate the trauma tingles, it was because I said to myself, I love you, Inkem. I'm not going to let you be subjected to somebody who treats you as if you are disposable. Like, there's the word delight, Right. I'm interested in relationships where we delight in one another, regardless of if they're romantic or, but that there's a sense of, and when somebody can't be delighted, at least not all the time, I don't, that's unreasonable, but at least some of the time, no, Mm -hmm. because I delight in myself. So I think that's the place where the boundary shift happened. Mm -hmm. Um, I've paid my therapist a lot of money. I have paid your therapist <laughs> also a lot of money. <laughs> we share a therapist. Sometimes we go Wait, together. Yeah, we, yeah, we share we a therapist. We are twins. We're, 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 we actually <laughs> oh, see the yes. same therapist. It's it's delightful. She's phenomenal. She's oh my God. Text do you want, me. Do you want to get in on this guy? Guy? <laughs> Yeah, you want oh, in yeah. on this one. Oh, yes. I have I have three therapists and I have been looking for more. <laughs> You're like Polly. Oh, she's therapist. a one-stop shop. One-stop shop. She fix me. I'll be oh fixed. Oh my god. <laughs> this show is also brought to you by the absolutely stunning and powerful tools of transformation that are created by Omala. 
Oof, even the name Omala transports you to a place of flow and vitality. These are some of my favorite products ever. They have an amazing color changing yoga mat that responds to your temperature and presence and reflects back your posture in real time. There's this incredible smelling skin balm candle that heats up to activate all the essential oils and vitamins that your skin has been craving. I mean, look, if I could live in a giant bath of this candle, I would 100% do it. They also have these journals that lead you into profound insight, and then you get to plant those journals to create a stunning flower garden. What? I mean, if that's not deep and inventive, I don't know what is. If you're someone who desires to live a luxurious flow of life and who believes in transformative wellness, then you have to check out Omala. Omala is giving my listeners an exclusive discount to treat yourself to something that is as special as you, boo. All you have to do is go to omala.com, that's O-M-A-L-A.com, and use the code Dr. Scott 10 at checkout. And a portion of every purchase goes to an incredible charity. You got this. So speaking of therapists, I want to do a little fun activity with both of you called, I don't know how to do a Rorkshark shark test, but we're going to do it anyways. This emerged from, I tend not to tell people I'm a therapist on a first date Art. because their, their typical response is, are you analyzing me? And my <laughs> typical response is, you couldn't afford me. Or is that what you think this the therapist does? Or, you know, I come up with some snarky response, but um, I actually don't know how to analyze them. Like, I wasn't trained in that. You know, I'm more interested in my trauma tingles anyways than, than, <laughs> than what they're... So we're going to do a little activity. And I, I asked both of you to create some Rorkshark shark tests, which are basically uh, blobs on a page that will each show each other. And, and if you're just listening in the car or on your walk or wherever you are, we will put the, the photos in the show notes and on YouTube um, so you can see what we are we are showing each other. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you one. Wait, but can we just... So the, I just want to say, these aren't real Rorschach. These are not blood. real. We, we literally we created them all them. last night. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, we, I don't think any of us really know oh, how those know. are made. No. Or... <laughs> no, that's what I love about this, is, is we're each going to say what we see and then give a little bit of a, a, an analysis that we're totally making up, just like we would on a first date with someone. Okay. So I made my Rorkshark shark test uh, as like a Dada-ist Rorkshark shark test. So I just smushed a bunch of blueberries <gasps> onto a page as, as my as my Rorkshark shark test, and I and I would love to hear what you see in this situation. Uh, oh my god, Scott, like The go first first? thing I thought was vomit. To be honest, <laughs> <laughs> looks kind of like bird poop. I'm sorry. Go on, tell us the story of vomit. Yeah, bodily excretions. Uh-huh. Um, but you know, those are actually very. So first of all, it, you said poop in Kim, and I said vomit, and those are excretory. Like that's like the body purging something. And you know, my tiny knowledge of Freud tells me that the excretion of like bodily material is developmental as well. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> yeah, poop is about production. Like it's about like. Um, oh, like I can let go and like have like, and I can, <laughs> and like make things. And mm. vomit is like a rejecting of like a nourishment, like re- rejecting of like an attachment. It's like this, this blot is saying to me, like, I can like let go and like create uh, like new love in my life and also like purge some like unwanted unwanted patterns. I also I think you could be like an art critic wow. right there. Like you just like. <laughs> <laughs> I was a cultural studies major for I one see year. That. I see. Very good. Very good. Very good. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, does someone else want to hold up theirs? I have a few more. You did AI. Yeah, I was like, oh, you know, if AI, if Chat GPT is taking over our life. Like, let's see what AI can do for us. What were oh. the words you put in? The key None. words. None. I just oh, said generate. Maybe we'll analyze. I just said stuff. generate. Right. So this is like, it's like the I Ching. It's like it's randomly yeah, generated, it's randomly but connected generated. to you. Uh-huh. Um, 
Can you see? Okay. I see two vertebrae and they're like having a stare down. Like one of them wants to take all the weight of the body and the other one's saying, no, I'm stronger. I'm going to take the weight. And so they're just like visually dueling each other. It's a stare down situation. And um, it's creating a little bit of havoc in the body. It's creating a total like numbing because I, I believe that's C3, C4, cervical three, cervical four. Are you a vertebrae. physician? <laughs> and, um, Are you also a physician? <laughs> Wait. St- stop reading me. <laughs> uh, and the neuropathy is real. And, and if I remember anything from Freud as well, uh, neuropathy is the internal desire to stop feeling. Numbness is the protective mechanism to which we can thrive. Wow. Wow, that was amazing. <laughs> truly, <laughs> truly. I see why they pay you the big bucks. Is that, is, that not, is that not what you wrote into ChatGPT? I wrote nothing. It was a random. It's like, just like it's like I Ching. I don't know. But- yeah, it's like, yeah, you just typed raw shot, like generate raw shot. it's like Rorschach. this AI generator, and I just like kept and so I liked one. Yeah, no, it's like you threw the bones, and like now we're just going to read the, like, I, I see two angels. Okay. I see like two little angels at war with one another. Oh, gosh. Um, it makes me think of um, Jung's like anima <laughs> and animus. It's like, you know, inside you, there are two attachment patterns. Mm. And they are struggling with one another. Mm. And the one that wins is the one you feed, you know? Okay. Mm. I see a unitary whole being pulled apart. And so it's being pulled (laughs) apart into two. And so, yeah, that's what I'm seeing right there. It's actually like a pull. What is the agent or the energy that's pulling it apart? Mm Mm-hmm. That's a great question. Thank you. I don't know. The silence is contemplation. I don't know. What is pulling it apart? Some big bang energy, maybe? Well, Some I, big what bang this, energy? What this tells me about you. Okay, yeah. What, c- c- come on, tell me. Tell me about <laughs> What this tells me about you, Inkem, is possibly that you're not attending to the meta construction of things, how things are operating on the bigger end of it you're really focused on the action and not the causation of the action which is like i'm focused on this relationship that i've followed in trauma tingles but not on the mechanisms of my developmental patterns that have orchestrated this reenactment i reject your your analysis <laughs> that's a real I reject your analysis you through some shame and that would be 500 I reject Thank your you analysis i live in the meta sphere right I live in the metasphere. Oh, that is actually really true about you. Okay, how about this? It's the fundamental nature of this Mm. to be pulled apart. So in and of itself, Mm. the energy in and of it is a splitting energy. So like an embryo divides, it is not an external energy. Mm -hmm. It is the energy within that causes a natural division. Well, there are actually these polar bodies, oh, two to that. three polar bodies, depending on the stage, that actually create the magnetism for the pulling apart of the embryo. But we don't have to get technical. Oh my God, my embryology is so... <laughs> this is embarrassing. I'm trained as a midwife. Oh my God. This is... I mean... I have no idea what you all are talking ooh, ooh. about. We're talking about embryology. No, I knew that. Out I just... embryology. I didn't get to the polls part. I was like, oh no. I have I, okay. I have um like first year biology and that is it. <laughs> All right, Kai. I'm gonna show you mine. Kai actually drew, which is impressive. Okay. Inkem, oh. what do you see? God. A cow. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's deep. Wow. Wow. Mm-hmm. So you're saying I'm a cow. That's it? Just stop in there. That wow. Oh, well, it's pretty meaningful to me, you know. Cows are sacred. Let's see it again. Let's see okay. it again. Let's see it again. No. Um oh, no. Mm, 
It's the sound I don't of know. silence. I would have like, it's like, I don't even, even have words. Like it's to me, like, are you allowed to interpret Rorschach through interpretive dance? Yeah. Uh, it's harder for people who are listening to, to, to hear the interpretive dance, but I could narrate your interpretive dance if you want to do it. <laughs> but I just, I mean, it's like a, it has a kind of a okay. movement. It's like, I don't have a, there's just no words. So there's, like, there's a, a jazzy flair happening, folks. Uh, there's no a, jazz a, a hands. contraction no jazz hands. in the chest. No jazz hands. Please be, be sure. No jazz hands. No, it's a jazzy hands. shoulder feel. That you're um, you're omitting. No, there's sense of like contraction, and as I do movement, then I can the words come. There's senses of um, contraction and um, energy, like really, like um, like you know, like lead. It's heavy, and it pulls in, and it's so heavy, and it's um, and then in other parts, there's a, a fluidity and attempting to move away from these heavy lead like sensations there you go wow wow perhaps we can close with my nephew's drawing i told him what we were doing and i i asked him to <laughs> draw me a drawing and and send me a photo uh and so i copied it here because i i'm not one to filter children uh or adults so here is the drawing oh i'm so curious what you see you know, it reminds me a lot of the hat or like an elephant inside a snake from the Petit Prince. Oh. Huh. I think he was trying to draw two phalluses to throw us off, by the way. Yeah, you know, I did. I did. That also came to mind. <laughs> <was like, laughs> came to mind. Came to mind. <laughs> Didn't think it was going to get, you know, named on a podcast, but. <laughs> oh, this is already an explicit episode. It's okay. Yeah, but then what are the sticks? Then I want to know what the sticks are. <laughs> I think these are hairs. If I'm if I know my eight year old nephew well enough, uh, this is this is a, a double headed phallus with uh, whiskers. emerging whiskers. follicles, whiskers, whiskers. Wow. whiskers. Yeah. What do you think that says about him? <laughs> Oof. I mean, okay, Oof. so that's not a raw shock, but. That is like art produced by an eight-year-old, and I do have a lot of experience with as an art, uh, therapist. Art, art therapy and children. As an art therapist as, of, <laughs> of pediatrics. Pediatrics, yes, God. Latency age children are interested in general in like the developing body, <laughs> like uh, also in taboo. Uh, also interested in like what are the boundaries and like how do we know them. Uh, so that's my actual interpretation. I was like, <laughs> um, uh, yes, so, someone do a more fun, a more fun thing. Though. I think it's pretty accurate. I, I, he was so cute about it. And, um, you know, I just, I just want to support blossoming artists on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I agree. Just going back to trauma tingles. I mean, so many, I think, following trauma tingles can emerge from the shaming of the body. And this is is such a, a, a an example of like when we uh, I mean clearly he was trying to be provocative uh, to which I told him he did a beautiful art job, which is not the response he wanted. <laughs> no, no, no. He, he wanted, wanted to feel like I was shocked, which I would never give right. him the luxury and the privilege of that. <laughs> <laughs> But but it is um, it's cute. But yeah, so I mean, to go back, just as we wrap up around like the the trauma tingles. I mean, I think shame is a is a really big instigator of where we shut down, and and where we replicate even those places where we might get to replay the the opportunity to be shut down or not connected to ourselves or to feel old feelings. My friends. Are there any parting words of around red flag couture, trauma tingles, or anything we covered, little golden nuggets you'd like to leave people with today? I really want those baby never text me again t-shirts. You, you yes. want the t-shirt yes. that says, no, remind me what the t-shirt says? Baby never text me again. Mm. <laughs> mm, the Please, power. I think that's the merch. That is that's the merch. merch. Okay, um, so we got a whole I merch really line like emerging. The, 
Uh, so, you know, this is the first time we've ever actually talked about dating <laughs> like as as a group. And I am delighted. I just really like that whole thing about like, you don't have to dehumanize someone to know who they are and to decide, you know, whether or not you want them close to you. And also, you don't have to shame a pattern. Um, like, we don't have to shame, we don't have to shame our attachment patterns. We can make agreements around how to be in relationships in a way that works for everyone, including not being in a relationship. So I liked that. Mm. So wise and balanced. What are you like a Libra or something? <laughs> no, you're a Scorpio. Uh, I'm a Pisces. I'm a <laughs> oh, yeah, I want a little fishy. Oh, a little fishy. Oh, I definitely think I might have just got my next tattoo. Baby, never text me. Again. That's your golden nugget is that you just got your tattoo. You also had two big epiphanies today. Yeah. Yes, I did about rooting boundaries and self love. And I think that connects with the other piece is like the worst abandonment is the self abandonment. That is the worst abandonment. And that goes for regardless of what your attachment style is. Because everybody, when we're doing our little repetitions, we're abandoning ourselves, some part of our needs. Right. So even if you're, avoidant and you think I'm focusing on myself, you're abandoning your need for connection. Mm -hmm. Um, So loving boundaries, Mm -hmm. loving, loving, loving rooted boundaries and uh, hold on to yourself, right? All your needs are valid. Mm. Yeah. And wear wrist guards, wrist supports when you're on the apps, just to support so you don't get <laughs> Oh, there it is. Baby never checks me again on the wrist guard. Oh, yeah. Oh, this yeah. is merch. This merch. is merch. Mm-hmm. I'm so glad we could come here all together and find ways to contribute to capitalism. Thank you all so much for joining me. I love you so much. To those who are listening, I hope you enjoyed this beautiful episode with In Kim and Defo and Kai Cheng Tom. I'm Scott Lyons, and thank you all so much. Thank you for listening to the Gently Used Human podcast with Dr. Scott Lyons and friends. Visit GentlyUse.com for fun extras, including submitting your questions for advice from a Midwestern mom. And don't forget to spill the tea and gossip about the show with all your friends and frenemies. And you know what? Show us some love by giving us five stars and leaving a review in your favorite apps. This helps us connect with all the other gently used humans out there. Oh, and by the way, you look fierce today. <laughs>